start. We have main engine start. Four, three, two, one, zero, and lift off. Lift off. In our natural pursuit of knowledge, space has always mystified and beguiled us. Over the past five decades, we've pushed the final frontier inevitably onward into the ether. The cost has been colossal. Now every day, new data, new conclusions, and the thirst for deeper exploration propel us inexorably onward. The advantages of the discoveries made through space travel are myriad, but the fundamental curiosity as to what is out there will always fascinate and taunt us. Come with us now into the unknown and discover the disappearing frontier. Coming up in this edition, after the Challenger accident in the late 1980s, NASA instituted a comprehensive shuttle recovery program designed to improve manned space safety and reliability, a program which is still reaping rewards today. Also, this episode concludes our look back to the Apollo 11 mission and what it meant to us. Not just the landing and the moonwalk, but after, we consider some of the philosophical dimensions to our life in space that was begun with Apollo 11. Also, we look at plans to build four observatories in space. The Hubble Space Telescope is the first, but when all four are in use, we will expand our view and understanding of the universe tenfold. And finally, we look at how NASA is helping to improve the accuracy of weather predictions by slowly flying over the ocean in a Goodyear blimp. In 1987, tests involving the Orbiter Atlantis at the Kennedy Space Center, Florida, were part of a comprehensive NASA-wide program to certify that when the shuttle did lift off in early 1988, every conceivable effort had been made to ensure the safety and reliability of the entire system. One of the most significant modifications that were made was in the design of the solid rocket boosters. The white booster design helped to propel shuttles into orbit. The rockets are made up of segments, some assembled or stacked at Kennedy prior to a launch. The join between these rocket segments was redesigned as shown in this cross-section view. The new design uses a capture latch to achieve a much tighter fit. A third O-ring is also included which allows engineers to verify that the join is working properly. And the insulation in the segments separated by a putty-filled gap originally is now bonded together. The new join was subjected to an extensive evaluation program including numerous rocket segment test firings in facilities like this one in Utah before it is deemed flight worthy. At NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama, every step was taken that was possible in order to ensure that the design was safe with as many tests on as many test particles as was prudent. Solid rockets have traditionally been test-fired in the horizontal position. The National Research Council overseeing NASA's redesign effort was briefed and concurred with NASA to continue with horizontal tests that simulate launch forces. This makes it possible to subject the rockets to even greater stresses than they encounter on an actual shuttle flight. In an effort to take advantage of their flight operations experience, several astronauts, including Bob Crippen, a veteran of four shuttle missions, have been given key management roles within the agency. Having overseen the restructuring of management and communications, Crippen was named Deputy Director for Shuttle Operations. Astronaut Brian O'Connor, pilot of the 23rd shuttle flight, is chairman of a newly established space flight safety panel with oversight responsibility for all NASA manned space program activities. With flight safety as a goal, work continued to improve the shuttle landing system. The greatest problems have occurred during landings at Kennedy, where the rough textured runway has caused excessive tread wear on the tires. At the Langley Research Center's Aircraft Landings Dynamics Facility, shuttle tires are mounted on a huge carriage. This 54-ton frame is then propelled down a runway at speeds of up to 250 miles per hour, simulating the forces of a shuttle landing. 
Engineers monitor energy stress, wear patterns and burn marks. About 10,000 gallons of water are used to drive the carriage with nearly 2 million pounds of thrust, the equivalent of almost 18 Gs. The people responsible for the shuttle's main engine have also been busy extensively re-evaluating almost every aspect of this system. The main engines have performed well during the years of shuttle flights, but the Challenger accident has resensitized everyone to flight safety issues. Main engine tests are carried out at the National Space Technology Laboratory in Mississippi and the Rocketdyne's Corporation facility in California. One of the hardest facts to accept is that no matter how much redesign and retesting is done, no matter how much effort is put into making the shuttle safe and reliable, there will always be risk involved. All that can be done will be done, and every person involved in the shuttle program is now part of the solution by sharing information and responsibility for safety. NASA's Shuttle Recovery Program, a comprehensive effort aimed at a successful return to space flight after the Challenger accident and continuing safely to this day. We pick up our story of what happened after the famous moonwalk in 1969, just as the Earth prepares for the splashdown of the Apollo 11, its crew and its cargo. Apollo 11 was preparing to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and was in constant communication with Houston Control. It was July 24 and the Hornet recovery vehicle was on station with the President of the United States on board. Re-entry to the Earth's invisible atmosphere carries with it one of the most critical moments. Traveling at 25,000 miles per hour, the command module can miss the angle of re-entry by only a few degrees and disintegrate into flames or bounce off into space, Velocity never to return. 33, Velocity 33,000 feet per second. 35,000 feet per second. 36,000 feet, 36, feet per second now. Blackout. There is blackout. Looking out of the window of the Apollo 11 capsule, we can get some sense of the heat and turbulence that the crew experienced during re-entry. The fiery beauty of falling back to Earth in a small tin can. The three chutes open beautifully and the Apollo 11 team float gently to the sea and into the arms of the waiting recovery team. Apollo 11 has returned safely and a grand reception awaits. The first man on the moon, an historic moment watched by millions of people around the world and now the Apollo 11 crew are back, heroes to the world. It seemed like every American alive at the time was marching and cheering the triumphant return. What was it that we were really celebrating? Three men who had done what no man before had done? A technological feat that was deemed beyond the realm of possibility? The fulfillment of an age-old dream? Were we celebrating simply because it had been a long time since we had anything to celebrate? Or was this something that touched an unthinking, irrational instinct in us all?
After the parades and the marching bands, the ecstatic crowds of people cheering on the Apollo crew, the work began quietly in plain, unadorned buildings to discover what we had really brought back from the moon. Now, finally, we had material from another world. Rocks and soil samples from a long time and a long way away. The treasure of the ages was ours. Stones from across the night, unwashed by water, unrubbed by wind, scattered on tranquility. The study began in earnest. Bombarded by solar particles for billions of years, but unchanged in any other way, the moon rock is like a diary of the sun. An eye unblinking since time began, it stared across the vastness of space and saw life on the blue planet begin. Remembered in these rocks are ancient sunspots, solar flares, and solar storms whose fiery arms reached out a million miles. If only these rocks could talk, what stories they could tell. Only by looking very closely, very small, perhaps we can see what these rocks have seen and look back those billions of years to decipher the life of the sun. Locked within our sun are answers to mysteries that have confounded us since we first looked up and saw this great ball of fire hanging in the firmament. We have reached out with our telescopes. We have reached in with our microscopes, seeking what is the source of life. What combination of energies and elements brought it into existence? What is the relationship between the living and non-living things? How delicate is the balance? Humankind slowly begins to realize how fragile is his bubble of life. How rare and precious is our very existence. How easily we could simply not have evolved or survive to ask these questions of these stones. Ours is one sun, in a sea of suns more plentiful than all the grains of sand on all the shores of all the seas of planet Earth. From the microscopic to the telescopic, our search for answers continues. What is out there and how does it relate to us? 
With the advent of Apollo 11, we are now free to wander from our home planet Earth, and perhaps with our newfound reach, we'll be able to find at least some of the answers. Someday we may know where we're going and where we've been, where is the end and where is the beginning, but for now, we can only study and consider. The Apollo 11 mission in 1969 captured the eyes and the minds of a generation. It allowed science fiction to be replaced by science fact. For the first time in our evolution, we have opened our minds to the reality of the universe. The moon's apparent lack of life causes us to think what makes us so different from the billions of planets in the universe. In looking out, we are drawn back in to examine what makes life on this planet so special. And how can we understand and protect that life in the future, here and in space? Everything in nature from the most distant quasar to the coldest chunk of cometary ice shines in a particular wavelength of light depending on its temperature. Many phenomena in the universe cannot be seen with the naked eye. Hot objects such as pulsars or dying stars emit gamma rays and X-rays, while cold objects such as stars being formed emit light in the infrared. These wavelengths can only be detected with very sophisticated instruments placed above our atmosphere. To observe the full spectrum of light, NASA plans to place in orbit around the Earth four great observatories. Disappearing Frontier brings you the planning and deployment, the hopes and dreams of the first of these four observatories. The Hubble Space Telescope, the most powerful and sophisticated astronomical instrument ever built. Once in orbit, the Space Telescope is designed to see the sky in all its splendor, stripped of the murky veil of the Earth's atmosphere. At the heart of the telescope is its near-perfect eight-foot mirror. It took nearly two years for Perk and Elmer to grind, coat and polish this single piece of glass capable of focusing light that began its journey through space billions of years ago. You can think of the Hubble telescope as a time machine because the speed of light is finite and Hubble can look back to where the journey began. The universe is believed to have begun about 15 billion years ago in an explosion called the Big Bang. Since then, everything in the universe has been moving away from us. Will galaxies and the stars they contain keep getting further and further away from us, or will everything eventually contract? The Hubble Space Telescope will provide the first real answers to these questions. Images of the planets can be seen ten times clearer than those Earth-bound telescopes in use today. They're similar to those conveyed by the robotic spacecraft Voyager during its brief encounter with the planets. But the Space Telescope, during its 15-year lifespan, is capable of studying these objects over an extended period of time. Its fine guidance sensors can point for a period of 24 hours with a stability of 7 milli-arc seconds. This type of precision has never before been even closely possible. Quasars are probably the most distant objects in our universe. They have an energy output a thousand times greater than our whole galaxy, yet all this energy seems to be coming from a point of light the size of our solar system. Where is all this energy coming from? Looking at this and other mysteries will be the second of the great telescopes, the Gamma Ray Observatory. There are some theories that say the energy coming from quasars may be caused by a huge black hole 
sucking up whole stars and then somehow spitting the energy back out. The third great observatory, the Advanced X-ray Astrophysics Facility, will study violent events of this nature which emit vast amounts of X-rays. The telescope will provide sensitivity and therefore readability to the millions of degrees associated with these hot, violent plasma events and record them by their X-ray emissions. The last of the four great observatories, the Space Infrared Telescope Facility, should complete our new view of what is going on in the universe. Its domain, the very coldest objects in the sky where stars are born and planets begin to form. NASA's four great observatories pushing technology into the 21st century to provide a new, more complete view of our universe. They're best known for providing bird's eye views of sporting events. But today, one of the blimps is giving scientists the perspective they need to study an important climate-related problem. Aboard the blimp Columbia off the coast of Long Beach, California, Dr. Denise Hagen from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory works with a sophisticated instrument called an infrared radiometer. The device measures ocean surface temperatures. Presently, weather satellites equipped with similar sensors are used to measure heat radiated by the sea. But satellites don't detect these temperature signals until they've traveled through the Earth's atmosphere. Dr. Hagen believes that water vapor in the air close to the ocean surface distorts these satellite readings. A better understanding of this problem will improve the prediction of climate change and global weather. The radiometer being used in the study, shown here at the NASA lab being prepared for a blimp flight, is essentially a three-foot-tall infrared telescope. The device can detect a temperature change as small as two thousandths of a degree. A blimp is the ideal way to fly the radiometer because it moves slowly, can get quite close to the surface of the water and is relatively vibration free. During a measurement flight, a gold-plated mirror suspended outside the airship reflects the temperature signals into the instrument. Readings are taken at a range of altitudes from 200 to 3,000 feet. While Dr. Hagen works aboard the airship, other members of her team take ocean temperature readings from a boat below. A highly instrumented buoy is deployed in the area where the blimp crew are sampling. These readings are finally measured against those taken by the airborne radiometer. The final step is relating this information to that being transmitted back to Earth by the weather satellites. This is done at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography at La Jolla, California. NASA's infrared radiometer studies, striving for greater accuracy in the way that we look at our planet. That brings us to the end of this edition. We look forward to your company next time. But remember, we are out there. What we can and can't see is out there. And the mysteries between us, although seemingly insurmountable, are encompassed by a disappearing frontier.